Welcome to CB8 Speaks. I'm Monica McCain Sanchez, a public member of Community Board 8. Community Board 8 in Manhattan extends from East 59th Street to East 96th Street from the East River to Fifth Avenue and includes all of Roosevelt Island. You can see a map of the Community Board 8 area on your screen right now. If you want to learn more about the Community Board 8 Manhattan, you can visit our website, which is cbam.com. We'll have a picture of the Community Board website up on the screen in a moment. When you go to our website, you will see the calendar of events. You can click on them, get more information about the meetings that are coming up, and also listings of the committees, members, and just general resources that you can get from the Community Board from the website. Now tonight we have as our guest Sharon Pope, who was until recently co-chair of the Housing and Public Safety Committee of Community Board 8, and Carolyn Winston, who is president of the East Side Housing Coalition. Sharon's co-chair is not with us tonight. Uh, the Housing and Public Safety Committee addresses the issues of rent and senior housing, Mitchell Lama housing, and as well as conducting informational forums on emergency preparedness and related safety issues. Sharon has been an appointee to the Community Board 8 area, Community Board 8, for 14 years, and she's a longtime resident of Roosevelt Island. Her education, early career experience focused on accounting and finance. She is now involved in mobilizing community engagement and civic service, and she has worked in New York City Planning Department. And she has pursued coursework towards Masters in Urban Affairs, and recently, until recently, was chairing the Housing Committee of Community Board 8. Carolyn Winston is the current president of the Eastside Housing Coalition. Her education and professional background has been in communications and broadcasting. She is the president of Winston Communications, which is a marketing and communications company. Now, the Eastside Housing Coalition is a volunteer organization dedicated to protecting tenants' rights and to prompting fair rental practices in New York City. Sharon, Carolyn, thank you for coming tonight to CB8 thank Speaks. You. Thank you for having us. Now, Sharon, let's get started to tell the audience what is the mission and purpose of the Housing and Public Safety Committee. Thank you very much for, for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, Matt Bondi, who uh, is currently the chair of the Housing Committee, wasn't able to uh, make it this evening. Uh, he's extremely passionate in, in housing and uh, public safety, and the community is, is really uh, well served uh, under his leadership. Uh, the, the Housing and uh, Public Safety Committee uh, has uh, two missions, if you will. Uh, the first is to uh, raise the discourse of housing issues that uh, immediately impact uh, Community Board 8 residents, as well as look at uh, public safety issues that, uh, that are a concern of uh, the residents of the district as well. The Community Board overall uh, serves as a, uh, or in, a, in an advisory capacity. Uh, but our role is to ensure that residents of the district are informed and uh, completely aware of what's happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis housing as well as uh, public safety. How did you get interested in working on the housing committee originally? Uh, it, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, I uh, have lived on Roosevelt Island uh, for a very long time, and uh, during that process, I saw a lot of building and uh, development uh, on the island with uh, not very much input from the residents who uh, live within the community. And I really thought that it was important that residents uh, be involved in uh, somehow uh, with the uh, development proposals for Roosevelt Island. And that's when I became familiar with community-based planning, in mm -hmm. fact. And so I uh, became uh, pres vice president of the Roosevelt Island Tenants Association and then president of the uh, Tenants Association. Now, your committee um, is very important. Mm -hmm. Housing is is so congested in Community Board 8 area. What are the hot issues you have dealt with on your committee? Mm -hmm. Institutional expansion, 
uh, I think, uh, as well as rent control, rent stabilization, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm sure that Carolyn's going to uh, talk about uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, also looking, we've uh, looked at housing uh, discrimination against uh, women who are uh, seniors, elderly women. Women often um, outlive their partners. They have uh, lived within uh, or have raised children in, in uh, the same apartment uh, for a number of years and their uh, rents for those units tend to be low. So we have looked at that as well. Uh, because of uh, landlord harassment. Uh, they would like to uh, uh, have these apartments vacated so that they could raise sure. the rent, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, now, one thing that uh, comes up every now and then is the, the term Mitchell Llama housing, mm -hmm. which used to be a very uh, well-known term mm -hmm. years ago, and we hear less and less about it. Could you just tell briefly what was it? Is it completely gone now? You know what? I think we ought to take a look at uh, the Mitchell Lama housing uh, buildings that we do have because mm -hmm. in the next several years, they will be gone. Mm -hmm. uh, take pictures because that's, that's, th there is no new development of Mitchell Lama housing. For the most part, they're uh, being privatized. And uh, that combined with uh, the fact that uh, there's uh, no building of Michelama units or Michelama developments. Uh, that essentially means we're we're looking at uh, a time when we're not going to have any uh, Michelama housing mm -hmm. or Michelama developments at and all. And I'll bet maybe even some of the people watching the show probably don't realize that Michelama's uh, credited with having resuscitated the city's housing. Yes, um, absolutely. Because it, it provided uh, new affordable units. Absolutely. And now it's, it's no longer existing. You have really hit the nail right on the head. It was, it was developed to retain uh, the middle class and upper middle class who, who really, in effect, are uh, the foundation of the tax base with, within the city. I mean, uh, teachers, police sure. officers, uh, professors. Now, Carolyn, can you tell us about the Eastside Housing Coalition and how did it get started? Sure. <clears throat> well, um, Senator Liz Kruger, District 26, uh, felt very strongly that uh, Eastside tenants needed a representative group, a tenant advocates group to uh, to go to to solve their pro or help them solve their problems. And um, so, in February of 2009, she held a community meeting, and uh, I was knew nothing, I just saw a flyer, and my building at the time was fighting an MCI increase, one of many, which I'll explain later, the major capital improvement increase. So um, I went to just get some information, and I was amazed, about 600 Eastside tenants turned out at this community meeting, and, uh, and a lot of older people. And uh, as Sharon explained, you know, people who've lived in their apartments protected by rent control or rent stabilization are often harassed by landlords. Anyway, that started the ball rolling. And at that February uh, 2009 meeting, they asked for volunteers to form a steering committee. And I volunteered. And since my background is in marketing, communications, and media, I, I chaired the uh, communications committee at first and started writing a monthly newsletter and then sending out by email um, bulletins uh, related to housing issues. And then uh, we did several more uh, events, town hall meetings and uh, community meetings, and we had a booth at several street fairs, and we kept gathering names and signing people up. And uh, we now are a membership of about 1,000 people. And, um, and I was made president in uh, July of uh, 2009. And, um, and I've enjoyed growing the organization. I mean, it's obviously, there's a need for it, and I think it's very altruistic. I've done volunteerism in other areas, but you know, since I am directly affected as well, but I, I hear so many stories uh, from mainly older people in the Upper East Side, as you say, it's probably the most densely populated neighborhood, in, I think, in the country, mm -hmm. if, if I, I'm correct. I think it is. Actually. It's like, you know, there's just so many uh, skyscrapers, not skyscrapers, but large uh, high-rises and all. But, 
that comprise it, and, um, and they keep building. But anyway, there there is an emergency uh, housing shortage right now. I think our vacancy rate is 3% now, and um, even more the reason that um, <clears throat> uh, we have to really protect rent regulation laws, which sunset this June. And um, But if, uh, if viewers uh, would like to know more about Eastside Housing and get on our email list, they can email us at e.sidehousingcoalition at gmail.com. And I think That's we have lengthy. that up on the screen, so Good. people can, okay. can jot that yes. down. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit of the history of the rent regulations? It's, it's long and complex, but I, you're a good and summarizing these things, rent control, rent stabilization, some of our audience may not know what the difference is. Yeah, well, um, rent control apartments are those that were built before February 1947, and it was they were in municipalities that were facing a post-war rental crisis, rental housing crises. And, um, and um, in order for those apartments to remain under rent control, um, the tenant has to remain in them uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry, they must have lived there continuously since July of 1971, uh, last time if you were a successor to a rent control tenant. Uh, and then when a rent controlled apartment uh, becomes vacated, it, it could be switched to rent stabilized or deregulated altogether. Now rent stabilized apartments are generally those in buildings of six or more units built uh, between 1947 and 1974. And uh, tenants in buildings, there, there are three areas of this. It's a little complex, so I'm going to read. Tenants in buildings built before uh, February 1947 uh, who moved in after June 7, 1971 are also covered by rent stabilization. And a third category of rent stabilized apartments um, covers buildings that uh, are regulated by virtue of a government supervision or tax benefit program. And uh, in these, in some cases, buildings with as few as three units can be rent stabilized. Now, similar to rent control, rent stabilization provides protections for tenants. Um, not only do they regulate the rent, but they um, give the tenant the right to required services by the landlord and um, the right to renew their lease, and they cannot be evicted unless they've broken some law. Uh, unlike market rate tenants that could be booted out any time the landlord uh, decides he might want to raise a rent or move a friend in. So um, <clears throat> there are approximately 35,000 rent controlled units and 1.1 million rent stabilized units in New York City, uh, parts of Westchester, Nassau, and Rockland counties. And the median income for these regulated tenants is $38,000 a year, which if you live in New York City could be considered poverty line, depending on your circumstance, if you have a family, whatever. And if uh, viewers want more information um, on rent regulation laws, you can read them in depth on the Division of Housing and Community Renewals website, which is now part of the New York State Homes and Community Renewal at www.nyshcr.org. And uh, uh, you can click on DHCR at the top of the page and go to the rent uh, regulation laws to okay, better understand. Okay, got that them. on the screen, Terrific. so um, people Thank can, you. can um, follow that. If, if, if I can follow up, uh, the Emergency Tenant Protection Act uh, uh, has a specific number of 5%. So these laws uh, that uh, right. Carolyn uh, just uh, uh, very nicely uh, summarized uh, for us uh, are, remain in effect as long as the vacancy rate within uh, New York City is below 5%. Mm -hmm. We have been existing mm -hmm. in a uh, housing uh, vacancy of, of less than 3% yeah. almost since the 1940s. Really? <laughs> I didn't know it went back that far. Al almost, mm -hmm. almost. And so uh, for uh, the most part, we, it's, it's, uh, as it, long, it, 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 what it really means is that, hey, it, we are less than 5% vacant in this city. And, when, and, when, and since that's the case mm -hmm. with um, rent control, rent stabilization, that means that, that people can remain within their homes mm -hmm. and uh, the rents remain affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 
I, I don't remember a time we've ever had anything other than low um, low vacancies. Right, or, exactly. <clears throat> um, now, Carolyn, what would you characterize as the key issues for your group? Okay, the Eastside Housing Coalition has joined with 50 other tenant advocacy groups, uh, community, city, and statewide in the uh, Real Rent Reform Campaign, whose mission it is is to extend and enhance the rent regulations which expire or sunset this June 15th. And um, the campaign's been very active, holding town meetings in all the boroughs with uh, assembly members and some state centers, other electeds, um, uh, going to Albany practically daily in the last few weeks uh, and uh, flyering uh, to sending out flyers to ask people to call Governor Cuomo's office to stress the importance of it. The assembly has uh, put together uh, <clears throat> an omnibus bill, which is now pending in the state Senate, which asks for several rent regulation reforms, the, the most important of which is vacancy decontrol, which has resulted in the, le the loss of 300,000 units of affordable housing over the last uh, like 14 years. Um, <clears throat> that means uh, when an apartment becomes vacant and uh, the landlord can uh, you know, take the the rent up to market rates, uh, and they there are requirements to do improvements, uh, and but there's no mechanism through which uh, the landlord is checked on. You know, unless the incoming tenant questions the 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 current rent. Um, so we're trying to get that done away with. Uh, the bill, the omnibus bill, also allows uh, New York City and suburban municipalities to bring former Mitchell Lama and Section 8 buildings under rent stabilization when landlords take them out of those government programs. And this would close a major loophole that will prevent the eviction of thousands of tenants and preserve the units as affordable. And also in the bill is uh, <coughs> Uh, calling uh, the the reform, uh, calling for reform of the major capital improvement uh, program because uh, right now landlords, if they make a building wide improvement, can file with the DHCR and get a, the right to pass along the cost to the tenants. Now that's that's understandable if it is indeed improving the building, but. Um, they are allowed to charge that surcharge in perpetuity long after they've paid for the improvement, which is just not fair. Plus that additional MCI charge gets taxed, tacked onto your base rent, and then it's subject to the percentage increase, you know, deemed by the RGB when your lease com comes up for renewal. So we want to <clears throat> make it um, a temporary surcharge and Certainly landlords are entitled to get repaid, but not to charge it forever. Mm. And uh, and then the, uh, this is my personal uh, beef because my building has imposed three in the last like seven years, I believe. And um, it's really not fair. And it also is a way to get, uh, well, obviously to push rent regulated tenants up to the 2000 mark that could result in what they call a um, high income deregulation. Uh, currently, the um, if an apartment reaches 2000 a month, which is very little in this city, and the, the tenants living in have a, uh, an income, household income of 175,000 per year for two consecutive years, uh, the apartment can be de deregulated. And there is, uh, the assembly has put out a bill that would increase the uh, the deregulation, the high income deregulation thresholds to three hundred thousand income and three thousand a month in rent. Permanently deregulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there also in the law in the bill is to uh, repeal the Erstat law to return home rule to New York City over rent regulations because New York City is very different than upstate and um, and the city doesn't have the power uh, uh, over these laws and so that's the, that's before the Senate and it's actually um, last year uh, well actually in 2009 they were pushing for a lot of these reforms but that's the year that the Senate went on strike so mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Hey, um, I had a question for Sharon about um, the concept of affordable housing, community district aid, and is there a general um, uh, definition of, of affordable housing and how much of community board aid is considered affordable? Do you know what, Monica? Uh, to some people, affordable housing and community board aid is an oxymoron. I mean, mm -hmm. who, right. who, who would look at and consider that uh, community board aid actually has affordable housing and the uh, district has a, a substantial amount of affordable housing units? Uh, not only Michelama housing units, but also uh, public housing units and uh, some uh, Section 8 units as well. And uh, those people need to uh, be represented and, and advocated for. Uh, could you briefly uh, explain what Section 8 is? Uh, Section 8 is for a uh, very low income. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, and, and oh, by the way, there are no new Section 8 vouchers mm -hmm. <laughs> either. Uh, so we're looking at the end of that program as well. Uh, in a few years, you know, I, I think perhaps with, within our lifetime, we're, we're not going to, they have simply stopped producing mm -hmm. uh, Section 8 vouchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that means is that it's, it's harder, it makes it incredibly uh, much more difficult for people who, who really move this city and drive this city, um, home uh, health care workers, for example, uh, uh, and, and, and other people who uh, contribute substantially and so much uh, to this city to remain here mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, New York City. But even um during the construction of the Second Avenue subway, people who were being displaced, they wanted it, they were supposed to give them comparable housing, similar rents. They they couldn't find any. I think there was like one building in the lower East Sixties, mm -hmm. far away from where they <coughs> exactly. people lived. Exactly. Um, now, Carolyn, uh, what would happen if the rent regulation laws are not renewed this June? You mentioned sunsetting. Well. Uh, it, 2.6 million tenants living in over 1.1 million apartments um, and it could uh, be subject to eviction. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, the likelihood is that the laws will be renewed, but they could be weakened, which has happened in previous years whenever the, the, the law is sunset. <clears throat> That's why the R3 campaign was pushing to get Governor Cuomo to include rent regulation laws in the budget. And in mid-March, Governor Cuomo said he would. He's, you know, he really he met with members of the R3 campaign and, um, and uh, seemed very you know, pro-rent regulations. Then about a few days later, after making a pronouncement that he would include the budget, he changed his mind, said it was too complicated, and of course he wanted to push it through to get the budget in on time which is admirable, but, um, and um, uh, Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver uh, released a report in March that uh, to, called the New Housing Emergency that uh, says the loopholes in the city's current rent stabilization rules um, could result, uh, or will result, in the loss of more than 10,000 rent-regulated apartments every year. And Speaker Silver has been very supportive of the campaign, and as has the Assembly, but now we just need to get it the governor's ear and make sure that it's not given uh, short shrift by waiting till June to make decisions on it. And uh, I, the worst case scenario, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if you, you agree with this, but the, the worst case scenario is not that the, the laws will not be renewed. Mm -hmm. um, we're, and I'm an optimistic person. I think that they yeah. will be renewed. And when Caroline said that there would be um, evictions, it, it, I think the likely scenario in the event that uh, the laws are allowed to sunset, the first is that landlords will raise rents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and in essence, will be able, forcing them will out be able if to, they go to market. To, right, of yeah. course. They'll, yeah. they'll go to market, and who will be able to... Um, afford these market rate rents, and that's what will lead to mm -hmm. uh, evictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just naturally occurring evictions. Right, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But there is a good chance that the laws will be weakened if they're, they're left right, to the last right. minute now for that, negotiation. Yes, and, yes mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you were mentioning that there are quite a few people who are covered by the um, laws overall with, um, with uh, the, the rent regulations, but what about um, Community District 8? Uh, and I understand you were trying to research. It's a little hard to get yes. a fix on or how, who's affected in our area. Well, based on the uh, 2008 census for assembly members, uh, Micah Kellner and Jonathan Bing's district, the combined uh, total of rent regulated apartments in those two districts are approximately 48,000 uh, units. Um, so if you uh, work on an average of two and a half tenants per unit, that would be a, a total of 120,000 residents in your district, in CB8's district. Um, Sharon, you're from Rizzo Island. How, how much of the rent regulation laws affect Rizzo Island? Because that is under a separate type of a governance. Um. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, we've had one building come out of the Mitchell-Lama program, and uh, people who qualified were um, offered, for example, uh, landlord assistant, uh, assistance packages. Uh, we have uh, three remaining buildings uh, on uh, Roosevelt Island that are uh, under uh, the, the uh, division of uh, housing and community renewal. And for the most part, uh, those buildings comprise uh, uh, approximately 90% of the uh, rent regulated units on the island. Now we only have about two minutes left. And um, very briefly, are you optimistic for affordable housing in the community district area? <laughs> yes. Uh, there are uh, a yeah. lot of groups, uh, mm -hmm. housing groups in this city that, I mean, I mean uh, that have really uh, banded together and m uh, made this uh, very, very critical to, uh, to pass and move forward. And uh, Caroline has been a part of those uh, efforts, absolutely. Now we have just about one minute left, so um, what we'd like to do is to, to ask everybody to please, 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 we are in Community District 8 um, in Manhattan, please visit the website. Please get involved in the community board because there are so many important issues that we cover and you've seen a lot of these programs, if you don't catch them um, on uh, cable, access, you can always see it on the internet. You can go to our website, cbam.com, and there's a link so you can see the past programs. And this has been very, very interesting. You've been so Thank informative, you. especially trying to explain the complexities of rent regulation in, um, in our area and, uh, and keep up the fight for affordable housing. <laughs> Thank you. We will. And we do need <laughs> to have it for the people who, who really live and work in this area. And uh, again, everyone, please come to community board meeting and uh, get involved too. That's very important. And Absolutely. Thank you both for being here today. Thank, thank you. you very much for having us. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs>